Hey, it's Simple Lines Anatomy, and this is a structural analysis video. We are going to be talking about the follower who approached us about trying to figure out what was going on. And this will be a two-part video series. In this part, we're going to talk about a summary, an idea of why this person has the pain they're having, and where it might be coming from, some theories, some functional anatomy that gives evidence and reasoning to these symptoms the person is having. And in the second video, we're going to talk about a more integrated understanding of that functional anatomy, things we believe are related to the problem from as low as the pelvis through the lumbar spine into, into the rest of the body, really, and relating it all together. And we hope this will help him or whoever he sees as a practitioner, maybe understand it a little bit better, maybe it could be helpful for them. But it's all just a suggestion. The first thing though, most important thing, I'm not a doctor saying this, none of this is a medical diagnosis or real medical advice. It's all for educational and artistic purposes only, just to be clear. So let's start in on the basics. Let's start in just on the summary of, of what brought this person uh, to us in the first place. So they did contact us through Instagram. They had seen one of our videos on the scalenes and its relations to the brachial plexus. And they said, hey, I've got this scalene spasm. That's what they called it. And it's giving me pain down the arm, including, but not limited to the left pectoral area. And this was first noticed after medical procedure. So after this certain medical procedure in the abdominal region, abdominal pelvic region, they noticed the pain. And I'm going to say right now, that's not the cause. I would say there's probably a stress relationship related to the procedure because I don't think it would, it would necessarily cause it. But it wouldn't help if you were not well leading up to it. That's, that's the issue. And I'm going to make a case for that as we go. And that's an interesting relationship, how the body reacts to stress as a whole and how it stays in a lasting way. Um, after this, after this period of pain, after the procedure, went to a massage therapist who really dug into that scalene area. They were trying to do good. Um, however, unfortunately, this person experienced a lot of numbness and tingling above the collarbone, into the bicep, and into the fingers. And even all the way into the ribs and lats. And a lot of these actually... They're not very complicated if you just follow out the nerves. And that's really what we're going to do for this. We're going to trace out these nerves in a functional and simple way, applying the anatomy that I hope you know, or you, you might know a little bit more about after this. So let's get rid of that. Let's talk about those scalenes first thing. They are some of my favorite muscles, not my favorite muscle, but some of my favorite muscles. So what you have to understand about really any of the neck muscles is that the head is kind of wobbling around all the time. It's always doing this front, back, you know, left and right. Just look at the proportions of the head versus the neck. Look at the size of the head. Look how big this is. Look, this is giant versus the neck. It thins down quite substantially in the neck compared to the head. That's a lot of weight for a small structure to carry. Compared again then to the thorax, obviously you've got a much bigger base of support. And this is why some of the neck muscles actually come from the thorax. But the important thing is the smaller muscles of the neck really have a hard job to do. So the scalenes for one, they go from the TVP's transverse processes of the cervical vertebrae. There we go into the first two ribs. I'm just going to draw one for the sake of clarity. But there we go. There's the scalenes from the front. And obviously there would be a bunch more fibers. And there's the scalene muscles attaching to the ribs. More from the side. Again, there'd be a bunch more strands. And they'd be going to, to multiple places. But just looking at them, just get to get an idea of where they're at. So these are what support the neck. So if they go from one thing to another, if they go to a wide, more firm place like the thorax, the rib cage, there's a firm base of support through here. There's a nice, stronger base of support through that sternum, through the rib cage, through the thoracic spine in the back. And so the scalenes pull from here to create bending and rotation, but I'll just say bending for now, of the neck and therefore the head. And that's how they do that. 
and that works great for a while. That works that works really quite well. But imagine for a second, imagine something happened to those neck muscles for whatever reason. Let's say we had a few vertebrae that were really stuck down here. They were not contributing to the motion of the neck anymore. And so that means the neck above it had to move kind of differently or more than like it had to move excessively just to keep up. So it was doing a lot more wobbling than usual and it was having to work extra hard to keep that head up. This is not an abnormal thing and we could include the other muscles. We're going to talk about the traps, sternocleidomastoid and the muscles of the posterior neck could be included in all this. But do understand as the immobilities arise or even the laxity and hypermobility uh, is occurs in the neck. We have to do something to stabilize this tissue. These muscles will now be strained excessively. There'll be a lot more pull back and forth left to right on these muscles. And so they have to react. They can't effectively support the neck anymore. And it, again, it could be immobility above or below it. It could be overuse too much excessive motion but when what has to happen at one point or another is these muscles actually start laying down extra thick fibers they start laying down fibrotic tissues it's kind of the equivalent of scar, scar tissue uh, very reducible of course given enough time pressure and uh, knowledge of the practitioner but it is reducible but it thickens those tissues it makes it harder and harder for it to move and it does a better job of supporting the head of course but at the same time it immobilizes the tissue and this can be a problem because it needs to move to be effective in its job it needs to move to take on various positions another problem so we actually have a lot of nerves running through this area. I've done uh, probably a few videos to date on this particular subject, but I understand that if the musculature is pressing on any surrounding nerves of any muscles, it can cause irritation to that muscle. Some muscles do it a lot more than the others, piriformis for instance, but the scalenes actually do make a good case. And the scalenes actually, what emerges from the scalenes is something called the brachial plexus. That's a whole bunch of nerves, and it's going all the way down to the arms. I'm going to summarize and simplify here, but it's going to all the parts of the arm and many of the parts that were described by the person who contacted us. So, hey, there's the ulnar. I uh, will throw in a median there for sure, and then the radial somewhere. I don't know. It's hanging out back in here. In any case, lots of, lots of nerves coming through here. And understand that if we pressurize that nerve anywhere, or really irritate it, you know, you could in, do through injection, through um, basically a, some kind of a puncture wound, obviously these are bad things, or direct pressure, you could make it perceive as if it was coming from somewhere lower, but actually the pressure was occurring higher up, because the nerve, the signals from lower actually come all the way through this nerve. So the signal might be coming from a receptor here, close to the forearm, but it actually travels up through a specific nerve and it goes all the way back to that cord, that spinal cord, that central nervous system. So we can confuse the system. It is not perfect. And this is where some of the issues come in. This is where some of the problems actually arise. So we need to understand that. So because of the fact that we've got a wobbly head that we need to support, we support it through muscular tissue. If they are overworked for whatever reason, whether it's immobility, hypermobility, excessive use, they will have to thicken to become stable. And when that happens, the surrounding nerves, in this case the brachial plexus, can be quite irritated. So originally, when the person came to us, they said, I am having pain down the arm, including, but not limited to, the pectoral area. They're basically described all of this, and we can throw in one of these. We didn't mention the median and lateral pectoral nerve, but hey, close enough. We're not doing too bad. So let's get rid of that. Let's talk about our next point. Stress surrounding the procedure. Again, I don't think we can blame the medical procedure. And I won't go into any detail on it. I'm just going to say, for the record, I really don't think that was it. But 
any procedure, any medical, anything comes with its certain amount of fear and oftentimes, and in this case, some discomfort. And that's a very normal thing. So with, especially with when we're talking about the, you know, GI, lower GI pelvis situation, it can come with a lot of initial, you know, um, fear leading up to it, a little bit of pain during the procedure and this can exacerbate existing things so this pain does come back through the system and pain and stress amplify other problems that's just kind of how they work they come up and they alert the brain and then it comes out they go in efferently and they come out efferently depending on what it is depending on where it's going and the body is related on a number of different levels and we can really look at the musculoskeletal system as one of the effector the effects the changes in that is the effect of stress however you want to look at that is fine but just understand that this is this is very much a well-known thing so the neck actually is a really good example of of how the body can react to stress it is uh, you know like almost like a, a barometer or a lightning rod for stress it's it's funny how much it is but it's from a wiring effect so there's two muscles in particular um i'm gonna i'm gonna throw them in but the the neck muscles in general do this so the two muscles I want to indicate are the sternocleidomastoid. So they're from the mastoid process of the temporal bone. That's this guy right here. This mastoid process is this little bit there. And it goes down into the sternum. Sternocleidomastoid, great name. SCM for short. And then we've also got the trapezius muscles. So they go all the way like that. Everybody's got great traps. Now they're in the back, so I've kind of drawn them like they're like they're going through. You know, they, they do not attach to the teeth. That's the platysma. But you know, give or take like that. That's that's the the traps. And now it's the upper fibers really we're we're talking about or we're showing in this case. But understand it's it's zero. Now they both, both these muscles have an interesting nerve that they get uh, innervated from. And it is the 11th cranial nerve, the accessory. And it comes out of, I didn't do that right, hold on. It comes out of the jugular foramen, incidentally with the jugular vein. So there'd be a jugular vein coming out like that. We're gonna leave that out just for clarity's sake. Vagus nerve comes through there and it goes on to innervate that. Now it originally comes from uh, the cervical spine, lower brain center not all of it, chunk of it, but it has some neat interactions within it. It has some really, kind of really cool interactions through that 11th cranial nerve. So again, that 11th cranial nerve would be coming through the base of the skull, so it'd be approximately right there, and it would actually come up through the foramen magnum from the cervical spine, and then out to catch that trapezius muscle there. So what's neat about it is it's wired into a certain brain center called the superior colliculus superior and inferior colliculus i'll just say the colliculus both we'll just say colliculus so there's the the main part of the brain Keep, there we go there's the main part of the brain i like that that's much better and we've got the brain stem which is a little bit lower down than that and this is not to scale at all but we've got a few points in that brain stem. this is inside the skull here there's something called the colliculi colliculus and there's about two areas we'll just draw them in like that and they send some of their nerves some of their nerves to and through along with the 11th cranial nerve and what it does is it's tied into our understanding of what's around us this is a really neat thing but when we hear let's say uh, you know bright light or or uh we you know, sorry we hear a bright light when we see a bright light especially in our peripheral vision on the outsides of our eyes we want to turn our heads towards that or if we hear a loud sound we do the same thing we turn our head very instinctively we point our eyes we look to that direction and then we turn our head so it's going to very quickly take us through nervous action, through firing off these muscles towards that direction. And though this is just a neat, just a neat idea in general, what it can do is change the tension in the muscle. So that I gave you an example. I'll give you an example of something that happens when there is a definite threat. There's a, I don't know, there's there's something ooh, over here. There's a squiggly line that's purple, and we don't like the color purple that much. We're really a bigger fan of teals. You know, that would be very calming, but we don't have that. So we turn our heads to it. However, when it's nowhere, when it's 
all up in here when it's a stress within our brain. And even though there's a real a real thing, like let's say we have a, a medical procedure we're worried about, or something that causes us pain that really can't be avoided, it's within our head, at least in part. And it doesn't make it any less real, but what it does is it decentralizes the stressor. And so when we don't have a specific direction for that stress, what we tend to do is tense up the muscles in general, bilaterally, both sides. And so what can happen, and this is a really well-known thing, we all do this, is we lift our shoulders when we get stressed out. We get full activation of both trapezius and SCM and a few other muscles. I really, It's not just these two. Um, full activation of these muscles, and they tend to lift the shoulders up. This is why when you're really, really stressed up, your shoulders go higher, your shoulders get tenser. It is the wiring. We can't control it, and that's how it goes. So this is the type of thing that can actually bring out neck tension. And maybe there was already, well before this, maybe there's already some problems in that scalene area, in that brachial plexus area. And this procedure, for whatever reason, just brought out those, those weak spots in the musculoskeletal system. Crazy thought, right? Okay, let's keep moving. So, we're all good on that. Let's talk about the digging. Again, I don't blame anyone for trying to do this. This was with good intention. Someone went after these scalings. They thought, I am going to make a difference here. I'm going to make a change. These muscles aren't behaving. Let's get them, you know? Probably didn't say it exactly like that. Maybe that's just me. But they went in there with a digit, a finger, and they either stripped through it, they went like that, down each individual fiber, or they started pressing real hard, or a combination of both. And normally this is completely fine if done safely. You have to understand everything in the body is sensitive. Everything is sensitive to pressure. And so this can be this can be a dangerous thing. You could do, do this with the hand and cause a problem if it just happened to be the wrong scenario. So again, I don't I don't want to blame anyone. This just just happens sometimes. If there is an already existing problem, which is what I'm I'm really thinking there is, especially because I've already seen um, this person's structures in the rest of the body. I've seen how their body moves through video images. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it can't be just this one thing. It has to be a little bit more, other than the fact that it always is more. But in this case, I'm fairly confident that there's, there's more going on structurally than just this scalene area. Anyways, if we had an existing problem, let's say we had an, an excess amount of tension to begin with, maybe even some simple previous injuries, and the brachial plexus, you know, which is doing something like that. There we go. There's a brachial plexus. Um, if you go in there and you press real hard, an already irritated set of nerves will get much more irritated. They will start to really fire off from a few different points. When this was done, when this was done, what ended up happening was there was numbness and tingling in the clavicle area, but as well into the bicep, which would be about there, and all the way down into the fingers. Not shown here, but we know which nerve that is, so that's not a big deal now we can trace this out and a lot of it comes from one small area so this all really does make sense this is not a difficult you know understanding once you learn these basic points so going right back to those scalenes because that's what they were going after the scalenes are right about here from a side view just so we're real clear on this from a side view if that's the opening for the nerve we'll say that's the opening for the nerves and there's a bunch of them, say C5 to T1 for some reason, the nerves will exit through the middle point. They'll go kind of like that. They'll exit through the middle point to form the brachial plexus. And the scalenes will pretty much be on either side. We're looking at this from a side view. So really, there's only a limited amount of space for everything to go through. It's very close. And in fact, it's, it's closer than I've drawn it here. This is actually a misrepresentation of the distance between. They are virtually touching at all times. And that's fine. It's designed to do that. It's not designed to take on excessive pressure. So because of scalenes, and this would be on the left side, I'm drawing it on the right just for, for communication purposes. So 
the scalenes were contacted. The nerves make sense. So you have some nerves in this general region. It's about C5. That C5 nerve going to the clavicle, maybe six, maybe four in some cases, depending on the per person, but C5, C6, as far as this goes. So this clavicle region where we're having some numbness and tingling. In the bicep area, that one is, again, seemingly further away. But very, very close. This is this is that, you know, that simple functional anatomy, a game that we play all the time. It's like, okay, technically they're they appear far away, but they are very, very close when it comes down to it. So there's the origin source, and that's a bicep, give or take, you know. Not a perfect drawing, but ain't bad. That's the bicep. And the nerve that actually goes to the bicep is something we call from brachial plexus again. The musculocutaneous. So there's, let's say again, we'll just fill it in. Musculocutaneous. There, musculocutaneous is five two seven. Notice we're one, we're one off at the clavicle area five six. Musculocutaneous nerve is five seven. And for those of you who don't know, that's just talking about points in the spine. So if this is T one here, this is seven. This is six and five above that. So we're, we're talking about a few inches. This little chunk right here is responsible for all those nerves so far. It gets better. From the side, I'm just going to show the same thing. If this is T1 about there, there's seven, there's six, there's five. Very small area. We're talking about tiny, tiny, totally close together, no problem. So. As we get into fingers, I, I'm going to assume it was the front. I didn't ask, but I'm going to assume it was the front. Even if it was the back, it wouldn't change things drastically. There's another nerve coming off that same brachial plexus that we call the median nerve. And it goes down the medial side, thankfully. And this one's behind the bicep, not through the bicep or into the bicep. And it'll come down. It'll actually go to the front of the hand and the fingers and a lot of the forearm muscles. And the median nerve is C5 to T1. Notice again the overlap. We're only talking about we're, we're adding a few no, more nerves here because you also have, you know, six, seven, eight. Don't get me started on that one. And then T1. So we're just adding, we're just adding a few. Understand all of this pain is from a very small area. If we were to dig into this area and start to affect these nerves, doesn't really matter where in the arm it is because even if we went down the back side of the arm, you know, through that tricep maybe and through the uh, back of the forearm here with its attachments it would still be the same nerve it would be a radial nerve and that's about c5 to t1 as well so, so the relationships are actually very easy here this all makes sense and when we when we start to describe in the next video the instabilities and the problems throughout the body that cause this neck to be so far off and uh, those scalings to spasm it's an easy one. The symptoms with functional anatomy, with understanding how, how these nerves can conduct pain in a confusing, but, but ultimately a wiring way, a, a way that makes sense based on wiring. It's, it's not difficult. Okay, last part. Last part, I think. And uh, we're going to take a look just at the, the final symptom. And this is aching in the ribs and lats. Also not complex. Very, very easy. But it seems like it far away. So it seems like it's really far away. The lats, for just for illustration purposes, they start all the way down here, all the way in that pelvis, the ilia. They'll attach the ilia, and they'll attach the lumbar spine, and they'll share some fascia, basically up until the point of the QL. And they will go, now this is going on the back side. It's going to look like the front. Go from the back side and attach right about there, right into that humerus wrapping around to the front and it's kind of fibered like so and i am just going to fill that just because this i'm happy with this so i'm going to fill it but uh, just understand it is coming through the back so it, you just uh, add a little bit of understanding there we go so it's coming from the back to the front and it controls internal rotation of the arm now understand it's it's doing 
a, a wide job internal rotation and deduction and you could say deflection or extension depending on where you put the arm that's not really relevant here but it's way lower down so to say oh we did a whole bunch of stuff bam in that scalene area but we're getting pain sensation from here that's crazy right how could the top possibly be affected from the bottom and vice versa well it's really not far away at all in fact, it's very, very close. So the lat area is an easy one because the thoracodorsal nerve, guess what? That comes off of also the brachial plexus. So bam, something right there. There's this, there's a nerve called the thoracodorsal, and it's going to come more along the back. And again, that would be coming through the back, not the front like it's shown here. And it is from C6 to 8, basically the same region we've been talking about this whole time, the same exact region, to go down to the lats to give it nervous innervation, to give it sensation and motor power. So just to look at this from the side now, I'll just do the same thing from the side. There's the lats going lumbar spine, and it goes across the ilia and through the front. Yeah, Q, it kind of shares some fashion with the QL, maybe into the abdominal area, and it's actually going to come around to the front. I've drawn in an exaggerated way here, but there we go. There's the lats again, and so that nerve's coming down just the back. So if the brachial plexus is here, it comes down more through the back area and goes to the lats to send off all the nerves for sensation. And that can be pain as well as motor power. And so it's not a stretch. It's not really a stretch at all that we could relate pain in the neck to pain basically in the lower back. Another area we can go for the ribs, this is, this is an easy one, it doesn't need to be mentioned, but I'll just throw it in there, um, is the serratus anterior, and that's one that goes from the medial border of the clavicle, sorry, medial border of the scapula, to ribs about one to eight. So if we're looking at it on this side, they actually come around like this. There we go. Really, it'd be the opposite, because the... the scapula is the moving part but around like this and this can explain some of the ribs like it's a long thoracic nerve t5 to 7 c5 to 7 and uh, yeah it's again the ribs the lats the low back area it makes a lot of sense what that also tells us ultimately what that tells us and we're going to try and back this up in our next video is that there is a relationship through the pelvis lumbar spine into all of this building a bigger picture of what the problem is and so that's where we're going to point our focus to and try to explain why the mechanics of the body can go into creating this, even though we're not necessarily talking about a true back pain, even though we're going to say that there doesn't seem to be one specific inciting incident. We feel somewhat warranted, no, we feel very warranted in saying that we've got more problems than just a simple neck issue. Please join us for our next video, part two, not part one. This has been Elge from Simple Lines Anatomy. I hope you enjoyed that. I did.